So when you're looking at determination and looking at traditional mathematics and statistics in this case and looking at validity and reliability, how do we use that type of framework if we are to use that framework and apply it to credibility in terms of evaluation or what are the standards that we should be holding utmost regard? Well, I mean, that's a, a very long question to answer, but the general type of answer there is that um, that's critical thinking. The application of math uh, and its abuse in the application, for example, taking statistical significance mm -hmm. to be true significance, was an example of abusing the math uh, in applying it to the real world. And we can explain in great detail just why that was an abuse. In fact, uh, both Jean Glass, whom you've interviewed before in this series, and I were part of the early fighting about that particular issue. It took 50 years for the mathematicians, sorry, for the social scientists mm -hmm. in charge of the application of math to social behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. It took 50 years for them to accept the fact that statistical significance was not a, a true representation of real significance. And um, they were very slow picking it up. And the reason they're very slow about it, uh, by slow I mean that 50 years before they finally agreed on that, um, the president of the APA, Paul Meal at the time, um, was pointing this out mm -hmm. in his public addresses and so on. But we, even with their leader, categorically rejecting this, that didn't drift down to the ranks uh, thoroughly until 50 years later. And we have the same problem with ethics now. Mm. It's, we're 50 years from the point when we set up a science of evaluation, the beginnings of a science of evaluation. But most of the people in the social sciences still like to talk about facts versus values mm -hmm. and to suggest that you shouldn't do your PhD in an area which involves values because that's not really good science. Mm -hmm. So we're slow to catch on because we're not taught this stuff. What is good science in evaluation? Good science in evaluation is knowing what your limitations are, basically. I mean, it's like good science in applied physics. Mm. Um, I worked for a while after I graduated as a mathematician in the aeronautical research labs of the federal government of Australia and on the design of airplane wings, which is mainly a problem in partial differential equations. And um, the, the, the real problem there was to stop the people who were sort of crazy mathematicians from taking over the design business uh, from the people who mostly used the wind tunnel. Hmm. Um, the wind tunnel isn't quite the real world, but it's a long stride towards it from mathematics. And you have to respect the wind tunnel results at least as much as the mathematics. So the business of discovering in ethics and indeed in any values area, um, including applied areas from physics. Um, the problem that you have to master there is when to hold back on the math and say that's just a level of precision and so on that we couldn't use even if we had it. So don't worry about not being able to get it. And that is part of the the part of ma applying maths that isn't maths itself. Mm -hmm. That's the part we don't teach. Um, there is some move towards getting that into the K-12 curriculum these days. I mean, it has been for a while with some people, but not enough. I mean, you've, you've really got to begin with the common sense math, math and work out from that. That way the kids stay with you um, mm -hmm. because they can understand the common sense problem that you start with. But if you start with the pure math, which the new math originally did, you don't have any grip on them. I mean, they're not worried about problems in pure mathematics. 
foundations of man. So you, you have no footage. I think that's an interesting point in terms of the limitations, because I think that would generalize into mathematics in terms of teaching students about the mathematics, but also the limitations of the numbers that they... Yeah. It's more of an enlightened mathematician, mathematics version, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, not, not what you position as crazy mathematicians. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. Right. Oh, yeah. You've got to be... <laughs> you've got to somehow get them not just to be good at math, but good at understanding what math can and can't do. And, and just like evaluation and, and the limitations exactly, and making them transparent. Exactly the same. Yeah. In 1999, you wrote a two-part article, The Nature of Evaluation, Relation to Psychology, in which you address the basic logic of evaluation and methodological skills that evaluators need to master. Piggybacking on this last conversation, what are these, these skills that are most important to evaluators today? Well, we have an attempt by the Canadian Evaluation Society and the New Zealand Evaluation Society, Aotearoa, I should say, that's the Maori name for the New Zealand Society, um, and in which they've made an effort to spell that out. And there are a couple of others. There's a US one from Minnesota, curiously enough. Um, and But these are all really beginning efforts at it. And you get in the basic stat, which is, of course, crucial, and basic survey methodology, and how to design surveys and so on, and how to get them in the field and get responses to them. All of this practical math, as well as the basic pure math in the stat, particularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got to have all that in. But then you've got to have this business of dealing with the values. And that's where the, these attempts at listing the repertoire that we need fail. They really haven't got a satisfactory treatment of what skills you need there. And that's where I'm working. We've got to have that or we haven't got a science of evaluation. We've got uh, what we might call a technology of evaluation. Mm -hmm. Very useful, but sooner or later you have to confront the need for foundations that will tackle the really big, difficult, con convoluted and controversial questions in ethics and not just the baby talk. So in terms of your current work, you also nowadays seem to be particularly interested in the future of evaluation in society which captures the title of a chapter you recently wrote for your colleague's book, Donaldson, that also focused on a tribute to you. Tell us about your most recent thinking in this arena in terms of the future of evaluation in society. Well, when you buy into studying or applying evaluation, you take on a kind of obligation to deal with a, lot, a wide range of questions. I mean, you might be working in program eval, but and not in personnel evaluation mm. at all. But the fact is that people working in personnel evaluation are colleagues of yours within the general discipline of evaluation. And the, all of these other subdivisions of evaluation, including product evaluation, mm -hmm. which many of us read about all the time in the newspapers, where the car tests, road tests appear, and uh, these are all a very good practical use to us. They tell us how to spend our money, where not to waste our money, and so on. Now, if you're going to get into that, uh, then you need to be willing to tackle quite a lot of foundational, semi-philosophical questions that aren't part of the normal curriculum. You need to be able to deal with them and fight for your solutions. I mean, you've got to be willing to go to war here about the values issues, not just the stats issues. Those we can solve, the values issues we still have to argue about. And in there somewhere, um, we've got to still do a lot more work than we have. In, in that, at that period, I was seeing that as the future steps of evaluation. We were going to have to get to that. Now I'm getting to that. I mean, now I'm focusing 
almost entirely on the next stages in a vowel, of which the first is looking at the way a vowel is applied to other disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, it's, in, it's interesting, well, it's more than interesting, it's crucial because the only reason they're entitled to be called a discipline is that they follow some rules. That's what discipline means. Mm -hmm. And that's why astrology isn't a discipline. It, it's, it's so called good theories aren't good by the general standards of science. And similarly, we have to look at whether the general standards of physics and of the, the accepted science are really being met. And it turns out uh, that they're not. Uh, it goes like this. Um, you ask physicists um, how they th come to think that. Uh, how, are we going all right for time? <laughs> um, you come to think. Uh, you ask physicists how they come to think that so and so deserves a Nobel Prize in physics. How do they select the best texts to use? How do they select the best work in the previous years in physics? In this evaluation business, they are bringing values to bear on data that is not evaluative. So they've got a procedure for doing evaluations. Well, what is it? Uh, how do they verify it? Uh, do they do this in a systematic way that we theorists and practitioners in evaluation? And they will always tell you the same answer. They'll say it was done by peer review. Mm. Okay, now when we look at the, the next question that a good evaluator asks, it is, how good's the peer review? Mm. And they say, well, I mean, what do you want? It's done by the best people in the business, good physicists, highly trained physicists, when in the case of research in physics. And so you say, well, what makes you think that they are the best? Uh, have, have you looked at them? Yeah, we've looked at their credentials. They have very good credentials. Have you looked at their practice in the practice of evaluation? When the review committees meet, are they behaving in a way which is good evaluative practice? And so the, the guy says, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we say, well, for example, surely you would think that it's really important that if you p pulled another committee the same size from the same pool randomly, mm. not just one committee, but you pulled two and you gave them both copies of the same proposals to evaluate and said, go to work and give me a rank order or uh, categories of A's and B's here, um, that there would be some close relationship between the two. Uh, and so they say, well, we believe there is. So I said, well, belief is good, but it didn't make the world flat. <laughs> Everybody believes it, but it was false. Now then, let's see the data. Then it turns out two interesting facts turn up. One, almost nobody has ever looked. There are two or th there used to be two or three studies. After we started on it, it's gone up quite a bit. But I mean, there's a handful of studies. That's point one. Pathetic, you've got 10,000 sciences dealing with proposals every day and you've got two or three studies about the reliability of their peer review process. Mm. Okay, second point that turns up, how well do the committees agree when you look at them? Answer, about as well as tossing a coin twice. Mm. Very nearly non-significant mm -hmm. statistically. So it's, it's hardly ever looked at and it's no good when you do look at it. And that's the foundation of all of science. So this is where we find ourselves moving in on other people's turf and pointing out how to do better. I mean, I've published something where I list 10 cheap ways to improve peer review. But you, they should have thought of this 50 years ago and incorporated it. So this is really bad stuff mm -hmm. and uh, a blot on the face of science. Okay, so that's an example of the next stage, which I call establishing evaluation as the alpha discipline. Okay. And that's 
stage one, which we're in now, and have got some very good results from. And then the stage two is take, getting to the po point where we make evaluation the exemplar discipline, so that the social scientists have to model a good, well done evaluation instead of the other way around. It's evaluators modeling what they do in research. on the social science here. Mm -hmm. And then the third stage, the omega stage of disciplinary expansion, is when they take on ethics and crack it. So that ethics becomes a subdivision of evaluation. So when you have doctoral students or master's students perhaps that say, I just want to be an evaluator, yep. what do I need to know? What, what's your answer? Uh, well, we've got long lists of stuff. You know, we've got pages. We do have these lists that have been drawn up by the three national, mm -hmm. and so that's a good start. So when they say that, you give them one of those and say, start on this. <laughs> but don't um, end on this. <laughs> uh, no, don't end up with this. Join the team that's trying to get the next step in place. <laughs> You also note that most recent discussions of evaluation are really focused on program evaluation and that there is a need to discuss the cosmology of evaluation. What do you mean by cosmology? Well, cosmology. is the earth going around the sun or the sun going around the earth? That is, is evaluation uh, built on ethics, an ethical foundation or is ethics built on a, an evaluative foundation? And we better decide which who's the foundation of the other, because right now, both of them are sort of incomplete foundations mm. for the other. It's an untidy situation. We've got to do better than that. Okay. And off the cuff, and all things including your long history in this area of scholarship, how do you de now define evaluation, and how has this definition changed over time? I think when I first published it, um, I might have said something about comparing to standards. And today I would take that to be doing a proto-evaluation uh, because the real issue then becomes well, how did you establish the standards? So now I wouldn't say that. I'd say evaluation is the determination of the value, merit, worth, or significance of, of things. 